A reinvigorated South Sea that boasts Alan Knott Craig at its helm plans to seriously disrupt the entrenched franchises of MTN and Vodacom in South Africa's cellular market. A looming price war may be good for consumers, but to discuss the implications for investors, we're joined by Fred Teeling Smith, industrials analyst from Stanlib. Fred, thanks so much for your time. Firstly, you. Alan Knott Craig, is he making serious waves in the South African cellular industry at the moment? Um, I think we've seen the start of what he's planning to do. Obviously, he's uh, fired, a, fired a broad shot across the bars of the other two network operators. While we have the, the asymmetry in terms of um, MTR cuts, which means that M CELSI does have a small benefit, but effectively not as much of a benefit as we've seen in some of the other international markets where the third and fourth operators have got a significant benefit in terms of termination rates meaning really what they have to pay to Vodacom for a call of being terminated on their network versus what they receive. Now, Alan is spending quite a bit of time with the regulator trying to get that asymmetry broadened as well as extended because it really falls away next year. Um, yeah, he's spending a lot of time whining and dining the regulator, so to speak. It appears that way. What, what sort of relationship he has with him, I'm not sure, bearing in mind that he came from the Vodacom stable in the, in the first instance. But he certainly is making some waves there. And it's always see that the regulator coming to the party, we're unlikely to see any much more aggressive pricing from a sell C perspective. We see, that, we see that they have launched the 99 cents a minute campaign. Uh, funnily enough, it's probably on a global see-through perspective. It's probably not much cheaper than what they were earning previously on a bundle, bundle perspective. But what it does do is create, um, I guess, some visibility to the consumer. Consumers now know exactly what they are, that what they are paying. Which is not a bad thing for you and me and everybody in South Africa. Absolutely. I mean, this is one of the things, Fred, uh, I recently changed uh, packages between uh, providers and being able to distinguish uh, who offers the most value is almost impossible because of the very complicated nature of the billing and the value-added services that are tied in. So uh, I guess the first thing that, that Alan Not Craig's got to do is he's got to make it clear what the value proposition is for Celsi, but how much is there in the arsenal uh, to combat and try and win market share from two very uh, strong uh, incumbents like, like Vodacom and MTN? I mean, I think he's realizing that they are very strong competitors and, and, and incumbents. Uh, stronger than he anticipated, or? Well, he, know, he was at Vodacom, so he knows how strong <laughs> Vodacom are. But I think it's, it's very difficult to just win customers from purely just from a cost perspective. And his cost differentiation, it might be a little bit cheaper, but it's not significantly that much cheaper to encourage com uh, most of the customers to migrate across to sell C. So he has to start offering additional things. And I think it's, it's chipping away slowly at the market and trying to attract customers in some areas where MTN and Vodacom potentially have not been, not been focusing. So it's a, I think it's a gradual approach for him currently. I mean, one of the things he has talked about is the fact that going into sell C, it's been a lot more difficult than he actually had originally anticipated. And I think more so around the people that were, were within the company. And, he, and he's, he has mentioned that he spent a lot of first few months that he's there, five months or so that he has been there, spending a lot of time changing the people within the business. And MTN and Vodacom, if he pushes them, could come out with a very aggressive response. So they have it in their arsenal. Certainly. I think their, their pockets are certainly much deeper than Celsi. Um, Vodacom especially needs to protect their South African market. It makes up over 80% of their current business. MTN, I think, will do a little bit of a following act with regard to Vodacom, bearing in mind that a large portion of their profits come from other markets within Africa. Um, Fred, just on that, I mean, you, you, if you're the incumbent, if you're the, the incumbent and, and now as Celsi, they've got to come in and try and win market share to, to, uh, to grow their revenue streams. Uh, you made the point uh, in your notes to us that the voice market is becoming very mature and there's very little growth there. And there's a lot more growth coming from uh, the consumption of data in smartphones and tablets and, and these sorts of things. Can you just color our thinking as to how quickly the data market is growing and whether that would be a key focus for not Craig and Cell C to really try and dominate the data space going forward? Um, I think certainly for, from Cell C's perspective, they've got a similar amount of spectrum as MTN and Vodacom, but with a far fewer number of users on their network. So they can offer a data customer a far superior experience than MTN and Vodacom, Vodacom customers are currently getting. I think for MTN and Vodacom, it's important for them to get the additional spectrum over time for them to offer differentiated data um, offering to their customers. I mean, as you know, 
your data speeds and things that are, are really not up to up to where they should be from an international perspective for you to actually utilize as much data as you possibly can. And I think although data is growing very quickly, the limitation is the quality of the network, really when it comes to how much data that can grow. So yes, we're seeing voice growth of sort of low single digits. I think voice pricing as we're seeing is coming down, but usage is ticking up. So it's keeping the voice pricing in the low single digits range, whereas the data growth uh, in terms of revenue is growing sort of 25 to 35% per annum. And while you have got that sort of dynamic growing, it's still giving them high single digit growth in terms of revenue, MTN and Vodacom. Why don't you stay with Vodacom for a little while? As you say, 80% of their business model emanates from South Africa. We've seen the change recently of Peter Ace, well, he hasn't stepped down yet, but Shamil Yusuf is going to be taking over as CEO. That took the market by surprise. You think everything's fine within the Vodacom stable? Um, I think it was a little bit earlier than the market was expecting. Within the Vodafone group, they have shown that they move around their CEOs quite quickly. So a three-year period is not unusual within the Vodafone group. It's probably a shorter period than we have become accustomed when we're looking at our CEOs that typically stick around for 10, sometimes longer than that. Um, sometimes so too long. Sometimes too <laughs> long. And I, yes, you're correct. But so I think it probably came a year earlier than people were, were, were anticipating. Shamil was sent through to Spain to gain some experience in terms of CEO position with the understanding that he could potentially come back and take over from Eleanor Craig at some point in the future. Um, I think with South Sea entering the market, they utilized it as an opportunity to bring in fresh blood into the market. And Shamil is, does have a sort of trading background in his, in his nature. So perhaps they felt that he was, he was a better person to attack Alan at his own game. One of the arguments you made, Fred, is that Vodacom is most likely to be hurt by Celsi than MTN. Is that strictly on the basis that Vodacom's activities are very uh, hampered or, or limited to uh, South Africa as opposed to MTN's broader, broader yeah, yeah. international franchise? Yes, correct. I mean, it's because Vodacom generates the majority of their revenues from South Africa, whereas MTN have got Nigeria and have, they've got Iran and some, a lot of the other African countries, which are growing very strongly for them. So if South Africa gets attacked through sort of competitive forces, it doesn't have as a bigger impact on, on them as an operator. I mean, we've seen in all of their markets, they are going through different competitive cycles. And Ghana has just come out of a very competitive cycle and it's actually started to grow 20% again, having, having, having grown fairly limitedly in, in, in the past. Whereas Nigeria, we're seeing quite a competitive environment for them currently, and that's probably holding back the growth in Nigeria for them currently, but it's a huge market for them. And if you look at the metrics in Nigeria, you have to argue that over time, it is going to be a good value generator for MTN. I want to go back to Vodacom just on a softer issue. With the rebranding that we've seen, obviously moving from blue to red, is it just a matter of time before Vodacom becomes Vodafone? It's almost there, isn't it? I mean, would, it is we, almost there. would I mean, we even really acknowledge it if it happened? I think as a consumer, you might not even notice it. One day you have a, got a Vodacom branding, the next day you wake up and you've got Vodafone branding. So I think, think the biggest move they have made was moving from blue to red. Um, whether it makes it different to the man in the street, I don't think that move has actually made a difference at all. I'm not a marketing per person, so I'm not an expert at all. Um, but I think it's probably inevitable that they would change the name to Vodafone over time. Maybe when Shamil actually steps into the hot seat. Maybe we'll see Absa go to Barclays uh, as well. But uh, just to ask you, Fred, uh, in terms of the MTN, uh, one of the prominent fund managers I've spoken to recently has sold out of his position at these levels, which I think is at about 160 Rand. Uh, the concerns were around not so much the ethical issues that have, uh, that have come out around Iran, but more around the actual mechanics of getting money out of, uh, out of the country. Um, the other concern of his was uh, the, the disappointment that you alluded to in Nigeria where th their, their subscribers are perhaps not as growing as, uh, as fast as, as they, they would like. So I just wanted to see at these kind of levels, are you, are you still um, optimistic and bullish on, on MTN and, and how do you factor into the uh, Iran scenario in your, in your valuation? You are certainly, I mean Sandlib is still a very important holding for us I and mean, it's still probably our largest holding within the group. Um, we still see significant upside in the share price relative to other counters in the market. If you look at the MTN's valuation relative to some of the other industrial stocks valuations which are through the roof, it certainly makes n no sense not to own MTN relative to those valuations, as well as especially when you consider what cash flows you're going to get out in dividends over time. You 
you, you will get out of the company. From an Iran perspective, unfortunately it's operating and performing probably better than I would like because of that, that hamstrung nature where you've got the cash flows that are ring-fenced in the country and they're having problems getting them out. Um, in Nigeria, as I mentioned previously, I think it's only a matter of time before we start seeing the growth bouncing back up to the 20% 20, 20 levels per, per annum that we had seen previously. But I think for in the interim, it's certainly going to remain subdued in terms of growth. But from, a, I guess, where we look at these companies, we look at them as long-term investments. And it's certainly Is this a blue chip worth having in your portfolio for the long term? Absolutely. I think the very first instance, you need to be able to tick off that Africa block. So if you don't have a positive view on Africa, don't go anywhere near MTN. But if you've got a positive view on Africa, well then MTN is the obvious choice to actually get that full exposure into, the, into that Africa growth. So if you weren't in MTN already, would you, would you still be, you'd still think it's attractive enough to be acquiring at this point? I mean, it's run quite hard. I mean, a few weeks ago it was sitting around about 140. It's now ticked up to around about 160 levels. I still, be, I still personally believe that there is value in there. And certainly as a house, we generally top up our exposure to MTN through share price weakness. Is there any way that Vodacom can get its Africa strategy right or is it just too late? For uh, there are not a lot of opportunities left in Africa and really what you're looking for opportunities are number one or number two operators in the country. There's no point buying a third or fourth operator as we've seen in Celsi. It's very difficult to make money. So they have to look at are there any of those opportunities? And there are very limited number of opportunities avail available for them. I mean, I think they've been focusing on getting their existing African markets correct and trying to make money out of them. And I think they've just got to that point uh, where they are starting to make money out of them. I guess the first logical step for them would be to move the Vodafone companies like, uh, countries like Ghana into their stable first as the first step. Fred, just to, just to finish off, we, we talked about data and, and voice in South Africa. What, what does it look like for the continent? Is, 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 is the growth in data the next big thing for the, the continent, or are we still betting down the voice uh, you know, customers? The voice, the voice growth is still growing strongly in the continent, but you have to see that data in Africa, where the level that it is currently, it has to grow strongly. We don't have any fixed line network in Africa. There's going to be a lot of opportunity for data. As soon as the infrastructure is in the ground, you're going to see more and more people that are using, using data. And I think in Africa, as we see those voice, voice revenues coming under pressure, we will see the data kicking in and supporting the growth going forward.